Okay, hi everyone. So I'm sorry for the long layoff between lessons. Uh, let's get back into the swing by studying this topic of Lagrange multipliers. So to put this in context, this is a technique for solving this problem known as constrained optimization. And the idea is that we want to either maximize or minimize some function f of x, which notice is real valued, scalar valued, so that it's appropriate to talk about either maximizing or minimizing. And, that, and which one you want has to be specified in the actual problem. Um, it could be both. We, as the example we're going to work on here actually asks for both the max and the min. Okay, but you want you specify the function to be maximized or minimized. You specify whether you want the max or the min, or both. And then there's a constraint, which looks like this. Um, there's some other function, g of x, which we set equal to some constant. <coughs> so the function g is given, is known, and the constant c is also known. <coughs> and notice that uh, g can be vector valued which means that you really might have several constraints, which you put all together in the form of a vector equation. So for example, if you have three constraints, you can write them all together as one equation between three dimensional vectors. Okay, what I mean by that? Okay, anyway, so that's the basic uh, problem to be solved, the constrained optimization problem, where we have a real valued or scalar valued function f, f of x, uh, that's called the objective function. So that's the basic problem to be solved. And now before I give you the answer, Lagrange's technique for solving this problem, um, let's work through a short example. It's always best, I think, to put new techniques in context with specific examples. And this example has the uh, benefit of being rather short um, and also rather easy to visualize. In fact, I've drawn a picture of it right here. So here's the problem. We have a, a given plane, and that plane, this is in three-dimensional space, of course, so the variables are being called x, y, and z. Right, roughly, like, uh, sorry, I'm using a new app here to record, so I'm not uh, entirely used to it yet. Okay, anyway, so we have the um, axes are labeled, you know, x, y, and z in three-dimensional space. And so we have a plane given by this equation here. So it's z equals 6 minus x minus 2y. Um, notice that, that that equation is first degree equation in, in x, y, and z. And as long as the coefficients of x, y, and z are not all zero, a first degree equation always uh, designates a plane. The graph of a first degree equation is always a plane. Um, why that's true is something that I address in another video, which I'll be posting soon, which also goes through a much longer example of using Lagrange multipliers to solve a much more sophisticated problem. So uh, when you watch that one, when you watch that lesson, uh, you'll see you know, a general proof that a single first degree equation in several variables always denotes a flat space of dimension one less than the space it's sitting inside. So for example, if you have three variables so you're in three-dimensional space. One single first-degree equation in x, y, and z designates or denotes a two-dimensional flat space within the three-dimensional space. In other words, a plane. And this is generally true. In d space, a single linear equation, a single first-degree equation in the d variables uh, of the space has a graph which is equal to a d minus one-dimensional hyperplane. So the, re the reasoning behind that, the reason why that's true, is addressed in a different video that I'll be posting shortly. Okay, for now, let's just take it for granted. 
Okay, and then the second um, set that we have here is a cylinder. And it has this equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1. Notice that it's a like a right circular cylinder. It has a circular cross-section. And then the um, axis of symmetry of the cylinder is perpendicular to that circle, or to the plane of that circle. So it's what we call a right circular cylinder. Okay, well, um, you'll notice that z is omitted here from the equation. This equation doesn't involve z. And um, I talked about this in my videos on quadratic surfaces, quadratic hypersurfaces. But since I made those videos optional, um, many of you may not have watched those. And so you, you, you may not know, so let me point it out right now, that if you have an equation in several variables that omits a variable, or one variable is not mentioned in the equation, or perhaps it is mentioned but in a very trivial way, such as having a term of 0 times z. So that's not really there. right? So anyway, if you have that, where z is omitted, let's say, from the equation, what it means is that the, the z-coordinate is totally unconstrained by the equation. And so if you have any point x, y, z that, that satisfies the equation, you can always change the z-coordinate without changing the x and y. And that will give you another solution of the same equation. Well, what that by changing z without changing x or y means you're just moving purely up or down. So this means that if you make any translation in the z direction, you stay on that, on that uh, object. Whatever the graph of that equation is, it's cylindrical in the z direction, because any translation in the z direction leaves that object invariant. Any point on that object will translate upward or downward to stay on that object. Uh, by any translation vector, as long as it's purely vertical. Okay, so you see that we basically have the equation of the unit circle in the in the xy plane. x squared plus y squared equals 1 just gives the unit circle in the xy plane. But then by dragging that unit circle vertically in the z direction, both up and down forever, that generates that right circular cylinder. Okay, Now that right circular cylinder intersects that plane in an ellipse that's shown in red. And I'm calling that ellipse capital E. It's a subset of three space, but notice that it's a planar set. What I mean by a planar set is that it's fully contained within some plane. This plane here, which I'll call capital Pi. So yeah, um, the ellipse E is just some planar set. It lies within some plane, which is itself embedded in 3-space. OK, now, we don't really know technically that it's an ellipse. You know, one has to prove that. It's not difficult to prove that that set really is an ellipse. Um, but that's not the point here. The point of this pro example, or the point of this problem, is just to find the highest and lowest points on that set E. So you can see it in the picture, the highest point, that is the point with the highest z-coordinate, is right there. And then the lowest point, the point with the lowest z-coordinate, is right there. So we want to find those two points. Okay, that's, that's the problem. And so we can interpret this as a constrained optimization problem. <clears throat> is that if I have constraints g1 of x equals c1, where g1 is just scalar valued. g1 goes from some region of d space into the reals. And let's say c1 is a real number. Okay, then I have a second constraint of the same type. And let's say a third constraint of the same type. So we can just create a new function, g, like a vector g, whose three component functions are these three. And we create a new vector, constant vector, C, whose uh, three components are C1, C2, C3. And then we can write the constraint as G of X 
equals c in vector form. So that's a very compact way of writing the constraints, but notice that it really is a, just a shorthand for essentially several constraints. Now, how many constraints can we have? We're going to find that you can have k constraints. This is all going to come in the statement of the theorem, where uh, k is between 1 and d. Okay, d is the dimension, so x is in d space. In other words, x is short for this list of variables, x1 through xd. So we have d variables. There's a total of d variables, and you can have up to d constraints. You can have one constraint, or two, or three, up to d. But you see, if you have more than d constraints on d variables, then in general we don't expect any solutions, because there are too many conditions and too few variables to take up the slack. So for example, if I put seven conditions on three variables, in general I expect there, there to be no solutions at all. There may be certain exceptional cases, but as a general matter, uh, the theory doesn't work in general unless the number of constraints is less than or equal to the number of variables. Okay, so the dimensionality of the vector function g is going it's going to be of dimension k. The outputs that is will be of dimension k, which will be at most d. So f is going to go from some region of d space into the reals. And that's called the objective function. It's the function to be maximized or minimized. Just a little piece of terminology. Okay, and then this g here is called the constraint function. And it's generally vector valued, but it could be scalar valued if there happens to just be one constraint. You see, in the case where k is equal to 1, then the, the vector function g will just reduce to a scalar valued function. Anyway, that's the constraint function. And then this equation here, where we set the constraint function equal to some given constant, that's just called the constraint equation, or simply the constraint. So it's only subject to that constraint that we wish to maximize or minimize f. Okay, what that means is that the um, values of x that don't satisfy the constraint equation are of no interest. The only values of x we care about are values of x that do satisfy the constraint equation. We just ignore all other values of x uh, in, the, in, the mac in the optimization problem. Okay, so um, to write, to think of it as a constrained optimization problem, we, we of course need an objective function. Okay, that for us, whoops. Bear with me here. Okay, yeah, that for us is just going to be the height of the point, z, since we want the highest point and the lowest point. So we want the point with the greatest z coordinate and also the point with the lowest z coordinate. Now, z is actually a function of x and y already. Right, remember that we um, the, the ellipse in question is a subset of this plane. And so every point on the ellipse automatically satisfies this equation, just by virtue of being a subset of that plane, which has this equation as, right, as its equation. So we don't need the z as an independent variable. Because we know we're on that plane, we know every point of interest is on that plane. Every point of interest satisfies that equation, and so we can regard z as a function of x and y. So let's set f of xy equal to that function, 6 minus x minus 2y. Okay, and then the constraint also is a constraint on just x and y. And we can think of that as g of x, or g of xy, which is x squared plus y squared, and we're setting that equal to a constant, c, which happens to be 1. 
right? So we're defining the function g of x, y this way as x squared plus y squared. We're defining the function f of x, y this way as 6 minus x minus 2y. So this is a, essentially a two-variable problem with a single constraint. We have one constraint equation. So we don't need a vector-valued function. We would only need a vector-valued function as the constraint function if we had several constraints. OK, well, um, to solve it by the Lagrange method, step one is to secure the existence of the global max and or min requested. OK, so you, you, this is very much like the relative extrema that we studied earlier, in that the practical method for finding the extremum requires you to know its existence first. See, the method itself does not tell you about the existence. The method may yield an answer even when there is no max, and then that answer would be totally meaningless. So uh, the existence of the, rel of the relevant maximum or minimum must be secured through other means, through totally independent means, in advance. Otherwise, the method is blind. It may yield some answer, which may be totally meaningless. OK, so that's going to be step one. Now, for us, that's not too difficult, because what we're really doing is we're trying to maximize and also minimize the function f of xy, which is this function, on a certain set. Let me call it the constraint set. And the constraint set, let me call it s in general, is just the set of all points xy in the plane that satisfy this equation. That is the constraint equation. So that's the unit circle. Now what do we know about that set? We know that it's compact. And we also know that f is continuous. And in fact, s is in the domain. That's an, another important thing, is that the constraint set is fully contained within the domain on which f is continuous. So we have a function f, which is continuous everywhere in its domain. In fact, it's the simplest function you can ever imagine. It's just a first degree function. So it's not only continuous, but it's you know, infinitely differentiable even. But certainly it's continuous. And then the set S, which is inside the domain, is a compact set. It's the unit circle. So it's certainly bounded, and we know it's closed as well. So the extreme value theorem applies. And that's going to give us the existence of a global max on S and also a global min on S. So the, um, that totally solves the, that problem for us. OK, so the extreme value theorem, when it applies, is extremely powerful. Just handle step one basically immediately. All right, so step two. The given problem has only one constraint equation. x squared plus y squared equals one. So therefore, the function g is scalar-valued rather than vector-valued. Now, in the general case, we're going to have several constraints, which we're going to put together into a single vector-valued equation. And in that case, the degeneracy condition has to be written is to say the following. So let's say p. is, uh, well, OK, I said the global max, but of course the global maximum value may actually be attained at many different points. So let me just say something like this. If P is a point in the constraint set at which 
F restricted to that set is globally maximized or minimized. then one of the following two conditions must hold at this point p. Okay, the two conditions go like this. One is the Lagrange condition which says that the gradient of f at the point p is parallel to the gradient of g at p. Right, when two vectors are parallel, one of them is a scalar multiple of the other. So this scalar, lambda, some real scalar, is called the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, now when you have many constraints, I'll just show you, um, and so that this is what the theorem is going to say. One of the following two conditions must hold at the point P. Either the Lagrange condition is one possibility, okay, or the second possibility is the degeneracy condition. Okay, which, um, let me see if I can write underneath here. Yeah, sorry, it's blocking me from doing that. But yeah, um, the degeneracy condition in a nutshell is just going to say that the gradient of the constraint function, g, at that point is the zero vector. Okay, and... Um, that, that's not a very general way of writing it. That This way of writing the degeneracy condition only applies in the case of one constraint. See, the problem we're working with right a little bit differently. Because you see, in that case, you're going to have many gradients. There's going to be like the gradient of G1, the gradient of G2, and so on. So, you know, there isn't just one gradient lying around that we can set equal to zero. We have to somehow combine all of these gradients. So what the, what the degeneracy condition is in that case, we'll have to wait until I state the general Lagrange theorem, which I'll do soon. Okay, but in the case of one constraint, this is a good way of writing the degeneracy condition. Okay, so we basically have two alternatives. Two alternatives. Either the Lagrange equation holds for some lambda in the reals. Notice, by the way, there's a kind of hidden existential quantifier here. Let me put it in explicitly. What this is saying is that there exists. Oops, let me um, do that in black. OK, yeah, um, there's a kind of hidden existential quantifier in there. What this is saying is that there exists some real number lambda for which this equation is true. Gradient of f at p is lambda times gradient of g at p. So it's kind of a quantified equation. It's asserting the existence of a solution lambda in the reals to that equation. Okay? And then the other alternative is that the gradient simply vanishes, the gradient of g, that is, simply vanishes at the point p. But one or the other of those must happen. Okay, now the reason why that's a good basis for a practical technique is because what we can try to do is find all points at which this happens for some lambda, all points p that is, for which this condition is true for some lambda, and then find all points p for which this condition is true. And then the global max, since we know it exists already, like we've already secured the existence, will have to be among the solution points thereby found. So if I have, a, let's say, a finite number of solutions of this equation, 
for some lambda. And by the way, the lambdas can be different for the for, for different p values. So in other words, suppose I have um, a particular p that goes with a particular lambda that satisfies that equation, and then a second p, which may have its own lambda. But if I can find all of those solutions comprehensively, find all of them. Now, of course, you have to be a little bit lucky to be able to find all of them algebraically. But even if you can approximate them numerically, you're still in pretty good shape. Okay, and then you try to find all solutions of this equation. Let's call them, you know, p1 prime, p2 prime, and so on. Okay, then the global maximum points that exist must be among p1, p2, and so on, or p1 prime, p2 prime, and so on. And the same is true of the global, global minimum points. So by just plugging all those points into the function f and seeing which ones yield the greatest value and which ones yield the smallest value, we've identified you know, where the global max occurs and also where the global min occurs. A new slide. When there are many constraints, let's say g1 of x is c1, g2 of x equals c2, and gk of x equals ck. OK, then the Lagrange condition reads, reads as follows. Then the gradient of the objective function at the point p will be some linear combination of the gradients of g1, g2, OK, I don't have quite enough room to write it there, so let me break it off onto the next line. And then the gradient of gk. So in other words, you take all the gradients of the constraint functions, gradient of g1, gradient of g2, up to gradient of gk, plug in that point p, th that gives you a collection of k vectors. Those k vectors live in d space. Each of these vectors is some vector in d space. And remember that k is generally less than d, could be equal to d, but in general, k is going to be less than d. So it's not going to be a full set of d vectors in d space. Sorry, this is a little mistake here. This should be a d. So generally, it's going to be you know fewer than d vectors in d-dimensional space. And they span some k-dimensional subspace of d space. But the gradient of, of the objective function f at the point p has to be in that span, has to be a linear combination of, the, of those, these k vectors here. So that's actually quite surprising, because the functions f and g are unrelated. f can be chosen completely independently from g. We can choose our objective function as long as it satisfies certain constraints, like it has to be C1. We'll, we'll lay out all the technical constraints when we state the theorem in general. But subject to some technical constraints, such as being C1, you can choose F however you like. And similarly, you can choose G however you like, as long as it's C1 and so on. So these are basically unrelated. And so it's actually quite surprising that the gradient of f at the point p, which is just a vector in d space, has to be um, in a particular k-dimensional subspace of d space. That is, it has to be, let me just go back. OK, so um, let's apply this to our, our particular situation. OK, sorry, you'll have to pardon the choppiness of this video. I'm still <clears throat> learning this new software. So hopefully it'll get smoother over time. 
Okay, anyway, so um, let's see how we can apply this technique to our situation. First of all, we're going to look at the Lagrange condition. Except that we're going to phrase it not in terms of a, a known point P, but in terms of a variable point X. Okay, and the reason for that is because we want to find all points P for which that condition holds for some lambda. So in other words, we want to find pairs. In fact, we want to find all possible pairs, if, if we can. x and lambda for which this is true. OK, and then separately, we'll investigate the degeneracy condition. which is gradient of g at the point x equals the zero vector. And again, we want to find all points x satisfying this. OK, then we're just going to take all the x values from this side and take all the x values from this side and put them together. And that will be our, our list of candidates. OK, and then since we know that the global max and the global min already exist, like that they are achieved at certain points, those points will be among the, the list of candidates. We can identify them just by plugging them into, plugging all the candidates into the function, seeing which ones yield the greatest value for that function and which ones yield the least value. Okay, so let's see how, how it goes. First of all, let's remind ourselves that our function, sorry, looks like this. That's the objective function. And the constraint function looks like this. So the gradient of f remember it's like the vector of partials in the correct order. I'm going to write it as a column matrix. You can either write it as an ordered pair or as a column matrix with two entries. But anyway, you see what they are. Um, when you differentiate f with respect to x, you just get negative 1. And then when you differentiate with respect to y, you get negative 2. Now, notice that that happens to be a constant vector, but that's not a general feature of things. That just is a coincidence based on the fact that this function happens to be linear. OK, well, linear plus a constant. It's x minus 2y. or minus x minus 2y is really the linear function involved. But then you add 6. So, OK, linear function plus a constant plus a translation has a technical name, which I may as well use. It's called an affine function. OK, so it's, it's really just based on the fact that f of xy happens to be an affine function. And that's why its gradient happens to be a constant. But in general problems, the gradient of f won't be a constant. It will be a function of x and y. So that's not a general feature of things. Yeah, this condition here, right? So we've already computed the gradient of g. It, it just turned out to be 2 times the vector xy. And we have to set that equal to the 0 vector, which is the vector 0, 0. And you can see the only solution of that is x equals 0, y equals 0. So it's very easy to find all solutions. There's only one in this case, 0, 0. All right, so we only have three candidates. for In our problem that we, that we started with, there are only three candidates. And we, all, we can just plug those all into the function f to figure out what's going on. OK, now the gradient of g we have like the derivative of x squared plus y squared with respect to x and then with respect to y. OK, so we can write it like that. And now we just want to set one of those equal to the other one times lambda. Uh, 
okay, and then solve for x and y. So this actually uh, breaks down into two scalar equations. We can think of it that way as a system of two scalar equations. And we want to try to find all solutions of the form x comma y comma lambda. Don't forget that lambda is a variable here as well. So in the end, we're going to just ignore the value of lambda. We're just going to take out the x and the y as, put, as a candidate point. This is going to be ignored in the end. But, you know, when we're solving this system, we have to regard this system as having three variables. Okay, well, um, we can do it in the following way. Often it's useful to subdivide cases where let's say one of the variables is zero, and then the opposite case is where that variable is not zero. Okay, you see lambda is zero, that has no solutions. You can see that immediately. No solutions for x, y, lambda. And that's because if I set lambda equal to zero, you see that this top equation will read negative one equals zero. And Obviously, no values of x, y, and lambda satisfy or make true that equation. So that means that we can ignore that case and just look at the case where lambda is not zero. Okay, now, when lambda is not zero, the advantage is we can divide by lambda. And if I divide the first equation by lambda, it gives me this. Okay, and if I divide the second equation by lambda, gives me this. Okay, but you see that this equation here can be simplified by just canceling a 2 from both sides. And then um, negative 1 over lambda is already known to equal 2x. So now we can essentially just ignore the lambda. And we, we see that in this case, when lambda is not 0, we can infer that uh, y has to equal 2x. Now the reason why that's useful is because there's a third equation here. I didn't really write it down, but there is a third equation at our disposal, which is the constraint equation. x squared plus y squared equals 1. See, that is uh, known to be true because those are the only points where we care about. We want to um, maximize or minimize the objective function only subject to that constraint. So the only points that are even candidates for maxes and mins are points that already satisfy that constraint. So those are the only points in consideration. You see, that makes sense because um, you've got three unknowns, right? We've got three unknowns here. And so to, to nail down their values, in general, you would expect to have to have three equations, three conditions. And that's pretty much what we do have, right? We have these three equations here including the constraint equation. So it's a system of three nonlinear equations in three unknowns. But anyway, you see, with that constraint equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1, now knowing that y has to equal 2x, we can combine those two. from here. Okay, a solution don't know what I just did there. Back. Oops. In the span of these particular k vectors. Okay, where g1, g2, and so on, up to gk, are exactly the constrained functions. Right? And this is, again, a subspace of d space of dimension k. So, um, so that's quite surprising. But notice that it only happens at p, where p is like a global maximum point, or a global minimum point. 
if you just choose p to be an arbitrary point, this um, membership statement here is not necessarily going to be true. In other words, for a general point p, this is not going to be the case. This is just going to be some arbitrary vector in d space, which may or may not lie in this particular k-dimensional subspace. But when p is a global maximum point or a global minimum point for um, f restricted to the set s, the constraint set, in that case, the Lagrange condition will hold. Okay. Well, actually, one, one of two conditions holds. Either the Lagrange condition will hold or the so-called degeneracy condition will hold. But one or the other must be true. We can simply replace the y with 2x, and then you see that you get 5x squared equals 1, x squared equals a fifth, x equals plus or minus root 5 over 5. Would be solutions for x. Okay. y has to be twice x, and so that's plus or minus 2 root 5 over 5, where the two plus minus signs are correlated. meaning that they're always the same. So they're either both pluses or they're both minuses. And that's because you see y and x have the same sign, since they're just um, one of them is twice the other. Okay, so that, that takes care of the um, Lagrange condition. There are two solutions. They are root 5 over 5, comma, 2 root 5 over 5. And the other solution is minus root 5 over 5 and minus 2 root 5 over 5. And notice that when I cite these solutions, I'm just citing the x and the y. I'm not citing the lambda. But I could. It's just that lambda doesn't matter in the end. There just has to exist a lambda. Okay. But what is the lambda, just out of curiosity? For example, if x happens to be root 5 over 5 and y is 2 root 5 over 5, what's the corresponding value of lambda in that case? All right, well, we can solve it from this condition. We know that y is just minus 1 over lambda. So if we solve that the other way around, lambda is minus 1 over y. So in this case, minus 1 over, so it's like 5 over 2 root 5. Or in other words, minus root 5 over 2. So we could cite the solutions that way, where like, yeah, where we, we could cite the, the first solution as root 5 over 5, 2 root 5 over 5, and then minus root 5 over 2. That would include the x, the y, and the lambda. But again, we don't use the lambda at the end of the day. So we may as well just omit the lambda. Point is, there exists a lambda. For each pair x, y, there has to exist a lambda that satisfies the uh, Lagrange condition. OK, so this is just really an aside. Good. Well, what about the why don't we go to the condition? So let's see how it works out. If we look at f of 0, 0, which is the point we found from the degeneracy condition, so that's just 6 minus 0 minus 2 times 0, 6. Okay, if we look at root 5 over 5, comma, 2 root 5 over 5, that's going to be 6 minus the x coordinate minus twice the y coordinate, so 4 root 5 over 5. And that's going to be 6 minus, like, 5 root 5 over 5. In other words, 6 minus root 5. And then if we plug in the other solution point, or candidate point that we found, which looked like this, remember that the signs have to be correlated. So they're either both pluses, as they were here, or they're both minuses, as they are there. Okay, but then you're going to get just the opposite. It's going to be 6 plus root 5. 
Okay, so you can see what the uh, solution is now. This is the highest value that we can attain from our candidate list. And this is the lowest value. See, it's a very easy comparison because the only other value is 6. And it's very clear that 6 plus a positive number, such as root 5, is greater than 6. And 6 minus root 5 is less than 6. So we've now identified this is the max value of f restricted to s. And this is the minimum value of f restricted s, and we've even found like the points at which they're achieved. Okay, now to actually answer the problem in the same terms as it was asked, remember that the ellipse in question was actually a subset of three space. So to cite the points on it that have a highest height, we need to cite them as three-dimensional points. Okay, so the highest point with the highest height would be the point with um, this x-coordinate and this And then the height z would just be that max height. So that's like the highest point achievable on that ellipse. And then similarly, the lowest point on that ellipse would be uh, root 5 over 5, 2 root 5 over 5, and then 6 minus root 5. Okay, so that's the uh, complete solution, sort of written in terms, in the same terms as the question was originally asked in three space. So we really solved this problem as a two-dimensional problem, as a, really a, a two-variable problem. But as a geometry problem, it was phrased in three space. So we should answer it that way in terms of points in three space. All right, and so that's the complete solution. So you see that the uh, technique is nice. It's a very beautiful, very clever technique. But what I want to do with the rest of this video Actually, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll cut it off and start a new video. But we, we need to prove this method, prove why it works. And that's going to take us through some pretty interesting material involving um, the notion of a manifold and the tangent space of a manifold, including the tangent plane of a surface or the tangent line of a curve. But we'll generalize this to higher dimensions. Talk about the tangent space of a k-dimensional manifold within d-dimensional space. Okay, so that's coming up in the next video. See you guys then.